Well, hey, thanks for tuning in for this episode of the Redeeming Truth Podcast. My name is Kyle. I'm one of the pastors here at Redeemer, and I am here with Pastor Dale and Pastor John. And if you've been paying attention for the last, um, you know, interspersed several episodes, we've been going over our our church is what we teach statement. And we do feel that it's important just for clarity and for uh, forthrightness for a church to to uh, to make available a statement on what we believe and what we teach. And I want to clarify something that does not mean that if you come to Redeemer Bible Church, you have to subscribe and adhere to every single word of our doctrinal statement. That'd be somewhat legalistic and ridiculous, right? Because it's a document made by by man. Uh, we understand that the Word of God is inerrant and authoritative and sufficient for all things. But what this document does for our church is to let you know, kind of in general, what we teach. And when you come here, what you'll hear. And so we want to make that clear. And so we've been kind of doing a series walking through all of the major points of our what we teach statements so that we can stand up straight, clear and say this is what we teach in these various areas. And we always preface, you know, membership and all of this with if you can be a member in heaven, you can be a member at Redeemer. And so there are certain aspects of our doctrinal statement that we will tell you what we teach. And you may be able to hold a different view biblically, and that's fine. And there are certain categories, like this one, uh, the doctrine of God, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have to get right. There are certain elements that we have to get right. Now, we understand we're in the day and age when uh, debates on Christology are, are numerous. Right, different terminologies, different things going on. But what we want to do, we're not we're not here to do a podcast on different views on Christology, right? We're here to do a podcast on on what our doctrinal statement says and why it says it the way it does, because there are certain things about Jesus and His person and His uh, His nature that are necessary to believe. Otherwise, you are not a Christian. And there are certain things that there's some debate and flexibility on. We're not here to get into those. We want to talk about what's in our doctrinal statement, and John in particular, why you wrote it the way you did, uh, so that we can understand biblically the the necessary things to know and understand about the person and work of Jesus. So I will answer that question, but because the way you said it, you did, I I think I should address the fact that when, when we wrote a doctrinal statement for this church, some would say that that's kind of an arrogant thing to do, Mm -hmm. write your own doctrinal statement. There are creeds and confessions that are out there Mm -hmm. that formulate it by some of the most brilliant minds in the history of the church. Mm -hmm. And here you are writing your own little know-it-all nobody. (laughs) Um, And so I I just want to say, first of all, that creeds and confessions are incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. They are, but they're not inerrant Mm -hmm. and they're not current either. They were solidified. Um, hundreds of years ago, 300, 400, 500 years ago, solidified back then, which means that they're not able to answer current attacks. Mm -hmm. Now you can extrapolate, Mm -hmm. you know, from those in order to try to address current attacks. Mm -hmm. But but really what is needed is current um, addressing of these attacks. So rather than updating historical documents Mm -hmm. and saying we're going to have the fourth, you know, uh, London Baptist confection, the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. Mm-hmm. We just said, well, let's just, you know, yeah. make our own. And it's not disregarding those documents. No, not at it's all. It's taking uh, truth that good theologians have worked hard to uh, to kind of explain and codify and updating it for today. Yeah, and then and and in ways that reflect the the pastors mm-hmm. the elders here at Redeemer Bible Church. So when it came because to Because it's for our family. Right, it's for our <laughs> exactly. We're not publishing this saying every church better believe this. This is just saying exactly. what we are going to teach. And so right off the bat when it comes to Jesus, mm-hmm. we made strong statements that he is the second person of the Trinity. Mm-hmm. He is truly divine. He is he's God in every sense that the Father is God, that the Spirit is God, that he is God. And, and that's, that is something that is u- ubiquitous. It's universal for Christian bodies. Mm-hmm. If you cannot affirm the true deity of Christ, mm-hmm. you're not a Christian. Yeah. You're not a Christian organization. You're not a Christian person. You're not a Christian body. This is, this is one of those doctrines that the church stands on or falls on. Yeah. And so wanted to make that clear from the very beginning that Jesus is 
the son of God. Mm -hmm. He is God in, in human skin, just like uh, he says when he calls God his own father in uh, John 5, 17 and 18, mm -hmm. it says, comma, making himself equal with God. Mm -hmm. And in case we didn't understand what that meant, the religious leaders there were ready to kill him for blasphemy. Mm -hmm. So they understood what he was saying. Even if we don't, mm -hmm. he was affirming his deity with that statement. Exactly. Yeah. And not only his deity, uh, but like, like we say in our doctrinal statements, so I'll read this. It says, God, the son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we teach that the eternally divine son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the visible image of God through whom God, the father created the world and currently upholds it is not created or eternally subordinate to the Father ontologically, though he is satisfyingly subordinate to the Father relationally. Uh, and we get into more of this, but yeah. the idea is it's not just that he's deity, that he is co-equal with the Father, that he is fully God, that he is not some type of different version of God, that he is co-equal with and singular person with God in that in that sense. And that statement there, he's satisfyingly subordinate to the Father relationally, means that he wasn't forced mm -hmm. to be subordinate. He wasn't forced to say things like, my food is to do the will of God, that my words are the words of God, I only say what I hear being mm -hmm. said, that he it wasn't something forced upon him unwillingly in 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 Philippians chapter two, mm -hmm. where he becomes um, he becomes subordinate, to, obedient to the form of, to, to death, even death on the cross. Yeah, that wasn't something that he was forced to do because the big God, the Father, uh, exerted his more deity mm -hmm. influence on the littler God Jesus and forced him to do something. No, he's fully satisfied in being relationally subordinate mm -hmm. to the Father. So, Dale, not only mm -hmm. is Jesus, the Son of God, mm -hmm. fully divine, but in the next part of the statement, it says he was prophetically predicted in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. became truly human when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in a virgin named Mary and was born Jesus of Nazareth. So I want to talk a little bit about the importance of not only the full deity of Christ, but the full humanity of Christ as well. Yeah, well, I mean, we needed the full humanity of, of Christ for us in order to be saved, mm. right? So for a for the right and proper sacrifice to the Lord for the sin of man, it had to be a man who mm. was perfect to make that sacrifice. Mm. So not only is the predictive prophecy of, of Jesus crucial in the, in the Old Testament, his fulfillment of it throughout the New Testament as authored by the, the gospel writers and, uh, and the epistle writers is, is incredibly important for us to be able to hold on to mm. um, and, and, and hold on to it so tightly and unwaveringly in, in a way that um, we, we know that our, we know that we know that our sin has been paid for by a sacrifice that was worthy of, of mm. um, God's wrath. Yeah, that's super well said. Now, it and and that explains why, you know, throughout the centuries this has been an argument that the lies and deceits of Satan are going to try to uh, uh, downplay either the divinity of Christ or kind of give us, well, he was only a shadow of a human. He kind of had a phantom body, but he wasn't yeah. really man. Yeah, no, his, his, the reality of him being 100% God, 100% man, our salvation relies upon it. Right. So if you're going to try to chip away at the, at the truth of Christianity throughout the centuries, this, the, the attacks always come from the same angles. They're always trying to either, one, chip away at his authority of deity that he had, or two, his humanity. Because so, if, if, if either of those fall, the whole Christian um, worldview falls. Yeah. And that's why it's important we say in here, and uh, maybe you can elaborate on this, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in a virgin named Mary, not just a young woman named Mary or a person named Mary. Yeah, I would love for John to, to actually <laughs> chime in on that because I definitely have I definitely have thought out that, but I think with John's expertise on this, it would be good for to hear from him. Yeah, what what we're saying is that he's he's truly it's fully is spatial. Mm -hmm. So so we're saying he's truly True. divine mm -hmm. in the sense that he is everything that God is. Mm -hmm. And we're saying he's truly human in the sense that he is everything that human beings mm -hmm. are, yet without sin. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to being born to a virgin named Mary, the idea there is that he is here is this divine person mm -hmm. being being supernaturally conceived mm -hmm. in, in a woman, in some way protecting him from the transfer of sin mm -hmm. into him. 
as yeah. as part so of so that would be called the imputation, human. the imputation of sin. Correct. Yeah. So he so he is not so he is everything we are yet without sin. Now mm. someone would say, well, to err is human, right? Mm. To to be a human being is to sin, and my response would be, not forever, mm-hmm. and not originally, mm-hmm. right? And so it is not at the core of what we are as human beings to be sinful. Mm-hmm. That is something that has been injected into us from the fall. Mm-hmm. But before that, what what is essential to us is that we are images of God. And so when it comes to Jesus, we're saying that he is everything human beings are. Why? Because we need somebody who is everything that we are to pay for our sins. Amen. If he's if he's almost like us or if he's not like us at all, if he's an angel, mm-hmm. for instance, he can pay for angel sins. But he can't pay for our sins because mm-hmm. he's not one of us. Yeah, the idea of the New Testament seems to be that he must be one of us in order to pay for our sins. Yeah, yeah. and and just to put it in human terms, and this may may seem a little silly, but uh, that's kind of one of the things I like about philosophy. At times, we use silly analogies just to prove, you know, to to prove the rule here. But imagine a human being is convicted of murder and an ape steps in to take the punishment. It's like, no, no, that, that's not one for one. Like the law would never be satisfied uh, with that substitution. And so in order for uh, the atonement to even work, not only can, and we see this in, in Romans 5, right? Not that that uh, uh, one would scarcely die for a righteous man, you know, and, but in this, this thing that, that even though, even if you had a righteous man, you could have a one for one substitute. So not only does he have to be a man, fully satisfying mm-hmm. the the full humanity in order to be a vicarious representative but also his value as a sacrifice has to be greater than one other person mm-hmm. and the only way to do that is to have him be divine mm-hmm. and in his div- full divinity his value is worth the sac- uh, his uh, uh, um exchange of sacrifice is worth an infinite number of human mm-hmm. of of human souls Amen. Yeah. whatever wh- whoever his people are Right. Yeah, exactly. And the, the the incredible thing about that is that the incarnation doesn't change after the ascension. Mm. So that right now and forever, Jesus is this God man. Mm-hmm. And that even talks in Revelation about seeing the one pierced mm. in the future, mm-hmm. that, that we will see him as the lamb slain. Yeah. Mm. As and predicted that, in Daniel, one like the Son of Man coming before the Ancient of Days to receive yeah. all that honor and glory. So that here you have here you have this person, Jesus, who never at any point in his earthly ministry was he not truly divine. And yet at the same time, at no time did he did the limitations of humanity keep him from being our redeemer mm. as well. Well, and that's kind of the next, uh, you know, it says here, his divine yeah. and human natures are now and forever united in his one person without mixture, confusion, division, or separation. Mm-hmm. And we talk about this, you know, in, in I, I've talked about this preaching, you've talked about this, that that Jesus' ministry as as the, the servant of God, the servant of Yahweh, ended in his crucifixion, and his ministry now of high priest is forever for us interceding before the Father, uh, this, this human divine connection uh, is eternal, so he is our forever representative. And then at no time uh, during his stay on earth was Jesus anything other than truly divine, though he had all the limitations that come with being human. We see that in Philippians 2, Mm -hmm. right? That Mm -hmm. not only for him to be able to be a human in form, but in experience, Right, and and I think this is such an encouraging thing with dealing with people in the church is that we we not only have a God who, who uh, created us and loves us, but has experienced every temptation, yeah. every pain, and yet <clears throat> did so perfectly. And for that us. shows up in the counseling room all the time. Right? Oh, we're able to show people who are struggling, going through um, personal struggles, trials, mm-hmm. um, temptations, whatever it may be. We're able to show them through the Scripture, like you you have a Savior that identifies with the very same struggles and the very same temptations that you are struggling with, right? Mm. Um, but he did so without sinning. And that, that's, where, that's where the hope lies mm. for them, not only for justification. Jesus, Jesus absolutely gets credit for our justification, but he also gets, with the work of the Spirit, he gets, he gets credit for our sanctification mm. as well. And, and we can tell people that it's not incumbent upon you to 
perfectly obey the law. We're called to obey Christ and we're called to obey scripture, but the burden of perfection, the burden of never doing anything wrong or constantly getting better and better at being a Christian. Yeah, that's rooted in pride, yeah. right? Because what, if you can be perfect and you don't need Jesus at that point, mm-hmm. you, why, why do you need a savior? Mm-hmm. The reality is there's a tension that we need to manage as people, as Christians. We need to fight our sin, but we have to understand also that Jesus paid for our sin and, and put us into a positional reality of freedom and liberty with the Lord. You can go to Galatians 5 and read about that. That is that is incredibly mm-hmm. important for us to wrestle with. Um, and what I usually tell people in, in this is, listen, that's, that's not a problem to solve. That's a tension to manage. There is a call to holiness. There's a call that we live our lives for Christ and because of what he's done for us. But there's never a call in the scripture for us to match the perfection of Christ. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. And the the idea in the doctoral statement as well is that when you read the scriptures and you hear, you, you read things like Jesus grew in wisdom and stature mm-hmm. or Jesus was tired. Mm-hmm. Jesus was hungry. Mm-hmm. Jesus was thirsty. Jesus didn't know when he was going to return. You Jesus read, was tempted. Jesus was tempted. You hear all these things. You go, wait a minute. God, God can't be tempted and God knows everything and God never slumbers or sleeps or God has no needs. And, you know, so, so what, what is that? That this is how Christians for forever have said, this is how we understand mm-hmm. Jesus in these moments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He is, he is completely God. So he can speak to the wind and the waves and they instantly obey him because he is Yahweh. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, right before he did that he was sleeping yeah why because he's human he's human. just as human as we are so it helps us read the new testament well when we have these this idea that he is truly human in every way that we are without sin and yet truly god in every way that god is god the fathers and god the spirit is and so keeping those things like you said managing that tension as we read the scriptures is critical because if we don't we become cults yeah we, we go into error that ultimately like dale said which is which is absolutely true it it completely guts the saving reality of the gospel amen because then you have a jesus who is not human mm-hmm. trying to pay for human sin which he can't do or Jesus, who is not God, who cannot have a, a seemingly infinite sacrifice for the mm, infinite, amen. practically infinite amount of sins yeah. of the people who are going to believe in him. You, so, so you have to stay on this, on this, this tightrope <laughs> of, of truly human, truly divine mm. in every moment and not deviate from that. Yeah, and that's why it seems like every major heresy from the early centuries was Christological. They're trying to that's argue right. with and trying to wrestle with, well, which one takes precedent? Well, maybe it's 50% God and 50% man. Maybe it's, you know, God, but he can't be tainted by flesh because flesh was evil and kind of a Neoplatonism view, uh, or he was fully human, but only maybe kind of infused with the Spirit of God. And, and if you believe in any of those mm-hmm. things, and we'll get to why this is important here, uh, is if you adhere to that type of belief about Jesus, it it nullifies his saving effect. And this is why we kind of say it the way we do here. I'll finish this last sentence. We consider him our final prophet, great high priest and sovereign king. Uh, his existence, virgin conception and birth, sinless life and miracles and teachings are true and historical, as we've talked about, as are his substitutionary atoning once for all death, burial, and physical resurrection, ascending into heaven and his present and his present uh, building of and perpetual intercession for his church and he will return to reign as earth's king in the future in light of all of this belief in him is the only way that a person can or ever will be saved and i think that that last line is important as to why we've word why you know really you've worded it this way is because this is the only way belief in the biblical Jesus in this fully God, fully man, sinless, miraculous virgin birth, uh, protected from a sin nature, um, historically performing all of the works of the law, historically living a perfect life, has performed that once for all death that we need for our salvation. Yeah, And nobody preach. else fits that, that criteria. My only response to that is that'll preach. That'll, <laughs> that'll preach. definitely preach. So the idea quickly is he's our final prophet, meaning we don't need any prophets yeah, after not, him. Not waiting for anyone we're else. We're not looking for 
Muhammad. We're not looking for Joseph Smith. We're not looking for Watchtower Track Society. We're not looking for any other mm. prophets. He is our final prophet, mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 18.15. He is our great high priest. We don't need any other priest. Mm -hmm. We don't need lesser priests. Mm -hmm. We don't need a priest above the lesser priest. We don't need one at the top like the Pope. We have the great high priest. Yeah. We don't need any others. Mm -hmm. And then he's our sovereign king. Mm -hmm. He is in charge, not tyrannical governments, mm -hmm. not tyrannical anybody. He is the one who is in charge. He is the head of the church. He tells us what to do and how to mm -hmm. live. And that's how we see him because everything about him is true and historical. Mm -hmm. Where this is not fantasy, this is not legend, what we have in the Bible. It is history, which is why he is the only way to heaven, which is why he is the truth and nobody comes to the Father but through him. Mm -hmm. And one day, while we say that by faith, one day we will say that by sight mm -hmm. because he will return. He will establish his kingdom and every eye will see the facts that we're saying right now. Yeah. Yeah. We don't gather together to preach, you know, the Lord of the Rings, which yeah. is a great story, right? We don't just believe it because it's fun. We believe this because this is the future reality that all of us will face, whether in the grace of God or in the uh, wrath of God. And so... Uh, you know, and we, we had a discussion recently on another podcast episode where the belief in these things, the historical truths of Jesus, the virgin birth, these, you know, sinless, full divinity, these are all coming under attack mm -hmm. by the use of postmodern language and the kind of shifting of terminology, which makes them people sound like they believe what we believe. But in reality, those shifts are happening because they're trying to undermine or maybe even unknowingly trying to undermine these truths, which then neuter the gospel, right? So not only do we stand on Jesus and his person and what we know, but the the divinely revealed truth about him in its perfection so that we always know that it's true. Amen. Right? Amen. All right. Well, that's our episode on God, the Son, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. We could talk about Jesus until he returns, and it would never be enough. Uh, scripture says that we could fill uh, countless volumes with the works of Christ uh, and yet uh, not exhaust every wonderful thing that he did. But hopefully this is helpful for you to understand why we uh, very clearly and purposefully worded our doctrinal statement the way we did. We want to defend uh, the truth about Christ, not fall victim to any heresies, uh, and keep our confidence firmly rooted in the unchanging, infallible, inerrant, sufficient, perfect word of God and trust it for uh, our life and doctrine. So thanks for watching. We hope this has been helpful for you. See you next time. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future content.